How, how's everybody doing? You guys doing good? This is what I want you to do. In all seriousness, um, if you're doing good, raise both hands. If you're just doing okay, raise one hand. All right? Both hands. Everybody's got their arm around their significant other, so it just looks weird. I don't know. Okay, so you guys are doing good. All right. I need, I need some volunteers. I need two volunteers that are just going to stand and not, not be required to do anything. Can I get, get two volunteers? Yeah, just come on up. <coughs> then I need like a little, brain, a, my, a little brain trust of like three or four people who are critical thinkers. All right, come on up here. Can one of you stand right here, hold this sign? All right, you go over there on the other side of the stage and just hold that sign. Uh, go all the way back so people can read it to the best of your ability. Okay. So on the one side, we have seriously effective and casually ineffective. And what I wanted to talk to you guys this morning, what's so great about being at this church is that we really get to decide what kind of church we want to be. And we can become a... Um, a really big church, we can become a, a, known for our worship, we can become known for um, the messages. I, if there's anything that I want to become known for, it's being an effective church. Would you guys agree with that? Because, I mean, you can have outrageous worship sessions, you can have an outrageous message, you can, you can have the best bread at communion, you, you know? Um, but I'd rather, I know that we're not going to be judged for how good our bread was at communion. I know that we're not going to be judged for our, how, how, how good the worship sounded or how, how good the message was. At the end of the day, it's going to be on how we lived our lives. Everybody agree and on page with that. Okay. So I need, I need three or four volunteers to just come up here and stand right here for me. Not begrudgingly, though. Like, excited. There you go. Okay. Three. Way to go, man. All right. Let me, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no man up here. That's amazing. We're going to lead the household. All right. Um, there it is. All right. Here's what I want you guys to just kind of talk amongst yourselves. I want you to decide um, how casually ineffective or how seriously effective the church is in the United States currently. Okay? My pulpit is going to be number five. And so that's zero. That's ten. Okay? That's like the Axe Church. And I want you to decide amongst yourself what number you would rank it, okay? They're saying way too much. <laughs> I was hoping there would just be a number that they would come to. What, what number would you give it? I need three guys <laughs> to come up here. Yes. Four and a half. A four and a half, really? Yeah. Well, what are your reasons? They're saying four and a half. I'd like to hear these reasons. Because there are some churches that are Holy Spirit-led and are really moving in that. Okay. There's other churches that are doing good things for people in the practical to help them out. So okay. So I don't want to give it, like, too far low of a number. Mm -hmm. um, but if, because we weren't really sure exactly what you meant by, like, Yeah. Effective. Okay. Well, then let's solve that problem right now. What is an effective church? You guys can yell out. What does it mean to be effective as a church? To co be spirit-led, spirit love people. What would you say? Did you say reach the community? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, there you go. Let me, let me say this. So you're saying that they are Christ-like, not just in the community, but at home. Gotcha. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, one that changes lives. Okay, so could we just settle it like this? The effective church, right, the, the, is effective individuals inside the church who are actually living like Christ. Would, you, would we agree with that? That kind of covers everything? And if they're living like Christ, that means that they would have a story about how their life is different on a weekly basis. 
So they're probably going to respond different than the world would respond, okay? And currently, um, let me just make up some statistics real quick. Uh, yeah, nobody can ever nail down these statistics, but what they're saying is, um, these are actually real, uh, <laughs> that 40, 40, 40% of, of people in the United States attend church on a Sunday, but that's actually not true. It's more like 20. And I think back in, now this one's, to my recollection, I think the lowest it's ever been was like eight or nine during the Civil War. So there's still people attending church, but people aren't attending church as often, which has brought the numbers down. So instead of attending church each week, people are attending church every other week. Make sense? So that literally like cuts attendance in half, which makes all the numbers look low. Okay, so now that you know what it means to be effective, are you going to keep a four and a half? Two and a half, like right about here. Okay, that's where they're saying the church in America is. Okay? Now, this might be challenging because, like, we are the church. I'm the pastor here. How effective, and my feelings aren't going to be hurt, do you think praise is at doing that? I know everybody has a bias because you go here. But compared to the Acts church, where where would you put praise? Yeah? Ah, all right. I, I, pers- I personally disagree. I think it's 10. No, I'm joking. All right, so you, you'd, put, you'd put us here, okay? Which would mean this, that 75% of the people who are here could stand up and give a testimony. That's what you're saying from this week? Well, let's just ask them. How many of you if, you, could, if you were asked right now within the next 10 seconds, be able to share a story that says, hey, this is how I lived. This is a testimony of how my life was different. Here's how I shared my faith. Here's a random act of kindness that wouldn't have been done without God. Here's me praying for somebody who, if I didn't know God, how many of you could literally, and it's okay if you can't, could share a story right now? Raise your hand. Keep them up. It's one-third. Right? So what's 67%? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Here's the, um, here's the, here's the catch-22 on that. Our, our world is so me-focused. It's... And, and, we, and we have our routines and we have our habits and, and we have our days. And it is so easy to go throughout the day with only being focused on yourself. It really is. It, it, you guys agree with that? That it is so easy to be me focused because the entire world encourages it, you know? And so you, we can walk through our days rather quickly and not be aware of the opportunities around us to share Christ, okay? And one of the reasons why we do that is because we are not, if we're honest, responsibility for the gospel is not put on your shoulders, right, to, to be love in the community or to reach out in the community. Because if we're just honest, how many, how many people in this place had somebody hold them accountable or ask them how they shared the love of Jesus with somebody this week? How many of you guys had, were asked that question? Ah. Yeah, I did ask you guys. Oh, nice. So you guys getting it? Because to be honest with you, everybody rises to expectations. 99% of the time we rise to expectations. But when we're not expected to do anything, well, what's the expectation? It's to attend church, and, and, and rightfully so. Church is awesome. We need that in perspective. We are a part of the body. He's our head. We're the body, and we come together. But until that you have the expectation of the gospel literally laid on your shoulders and you say, you know what, this thing that I've been given is for me to share and walk out and act on, and it's actually the reason why I'm here. Until that happens, we're probably not going to be the most effective church. Does this sound like Chinese, or this is all kind of just making sense? Okay. Assuming nobody in here knows Chinese, fluently.
Okay, so the reason why the church is so vital is often, how many of you guys went to church when you were little? Go ahead, raise your hand. Okay. That's why you take kids to church probably, right? Um, when I went to church, your introduction to the church is, is vital because it's like, that's what represents Jesus, you know? I, I, I remember all of the paintings. I, I remember the pastor. I, re, I remember the people. I, I remember everybody. And, and it's like, this is your introduction to who Jesus is. And as you walk into that church, oftentimes the relationship that you can have with Jesus is, is put with this, these barriers and these boundaries that are just given to you in church. How many of you were ever personally discipled by somebody? Raise your hand. Twenty. That's that's amazing. That's really high. Um, most often than not, we are not individually discipled. We are individually driven to church. Okay? And then it's in that place where we are introduced to what it means to be a Christian. And some of us are introduced to the Holy Spirit. Some of us aren't. Some of us are introduced to the voice of God. Some of us aren't. Some of us are introduced to gifts. Some of us aren't. Some of us are introduced to the the Bible and it's emphasized. Some of us aren't. But there's this, this vast thing that we're introduced to. And most likely, it's misrepresented to some degree in some way. Basically, because unless it's operating at full capacity, you get introduced to something weak or in need of improvement. And I'm not saying that we aren't. We are. What I'm saying is, but what you're introduced to greatly affects the way you see it. How many of you guys know if you were introduced to a nine church, a seriously effective church, that your expectations on your own life would probably be seriously effective? Right? Okay, but if you're introduced to a casually ineffective church, you probably don't have any expectations for yourself. You know what I mean? You're going to heaven one day, and you're just kind of living this life however you see fit, and it's like, oh, well, we'll see what happens, right? But if you saw something when you were young, you probably have more of the weight on your shoulders. How many of you guys, did did anybody see anything like, Seriously, seriously effective. Um, I mean, the, the community was impacted. People were touched. There were testimonies galore. Did anybody go to a church like that? Growing up, go ahead, raise your hand. Okay, awesome. Because how we decide this goes is what they see, not only that, but why would you ever want to go to an ineffective church? That would just get old and like, ugh. You know? And we have... Okay, let me just talk about motive real quick. How many of you guys know that you get married first, then you work on your motive? If you had to work on your motive before you got married, you'd be waiting a long time. What I mean by that is, is when you get married, you get married because you want to be with that person. But your motive could be selfish because you want to be with that person. Later on down the line, as you live with that person and you're married, you develop a greater love, a more real love, a God love for that person. Does that make sense? Okay, the same thing is true with putting on literally the Great Commission and and loving people. It's like, yeah, your motive in the beginning is going to be really messy. But unless you get on with it, the the motive will never be adjusted. And so oftentimes the church is our first glimpse of how things work with the Lord. This can be good or bad. And here's, here's... Every commandment, I believe, can be put in these categories. You have commandments around the church that you're supposed to have community with that church and that the love of the brethren, and you're supposed to serve them. For God, you're supposed to obey him, and you're supposed to have communion with him. And when I say communion, I mean relationship. And the world, you're supposed to abstain from the behaviors of the world, and you're supposed to minister to the world. Was that introduced to you in church when you were young? Here's what was introduced to me. Personally, I was supposed to abstain from the world, and I was supposed to obey God and uh, have community and, and serve the church. But I, I didn't know that I could have communion with God and I didn't know I was supposed to minister to the world. That's not a very fun Christianity. Are you guys feeling me? So that, that's the full range of what it is that, 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 we, that we need to, to be um, working out in our own lives. But 
Do you guys remember when, when Jesus left the woman at the well? Brian, correct me if I'm wrong here. But he left the woman at the well and they asked him about the bread and he said, I, I'm eating bread that I know nothing about. I think you brought that up this week. Okay, but he just got done ministering to her and they're like, you know, they're talking about bread and he's like, listen, I, I'm eating bread that you know nothing about. There's a bread that you're meant to eat of and it's doing the will of God. And when you eat it, you're satisfied. There's another bread, like Brian said, your daily bread in that relationship with him that is necessary. So I, I'm coming at you from the context of, of you have a healthy prayer life. And then out of that prayer life that we're moving forward with an expectation on our shoulders to love people, now listen to me. This is so simple. What if we all went out of our way to love somebody this week? One person. Do you know how many minutes that takes? Five minutes. What if, how many of you guys have a friend right now who's walking through something hard? Here's, here's, here's what the gospel is. You call them and say, how are you doing? praying for you. Is there anything I can pray specifically for you? I want to encourage you at this time. Here's what's important. Give them perspective. You got it. If they don't go to church, invite them to church and say, hey, would you like to come to church with me this Sunday? The reason why I'm saying that is because church is vital. I've never seen somebody on fire for the Lord walking out the gospel who didn't attend church and take it seriously. That person doesn't exist. There's nobody who's disconnected from the body who's getting it done. The people who are getting it done see the church for what it is, take part in it. What I'm saying is this. In my experience, I've walked people through tough seasons, but I didn't plug them in the church. And when I didn't plug them in the church, guess what happened? Another hard season came, right? And they were asking all these questions. Well, why did God let it happen again? Or why is this happening again? But, and, and then like when, when I try to go back and walk them through that season again, it's not as effective as it was the first time because they're like, I've already heard all this stuff, but we never plugged them in. Can anybody relate to that story? Without plugging somebody in to the body, I, I don't see how, how that, that future or their perspective is going to get brighter because the next tribulation is coming down the lane. There are some uh, scripture verses in Hebrew I, I just, I just want to read to you. And there's nothing like Hebrews. That is, it's one of the most sobering books in there. In Hebrews 2, it says, For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Some people's theologies say this, well, you can't drift away from it. Hebrews says you can drift away from it. I trust Hebrews more so than someone's opinion. You guys get what I'm saying? So we need to pay closer attention which means this, that I, I need to take my prayer life seriously, I take the church seriously, and, and, I, and I'm paying closer attention to what was said. Here's why. So that we will not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. At a very young age, the gospel seems so serious to me. The reason it seems so serious is because of what Brian said. I would sit there and I would read the book. I had the Good News Bible with the little uh, stick figure drawings. Anybody have that Bible? And, and I would sit there and I'd read it and I'd be like, oh my, this is some serious stuff in here. And, and so it, it, I've always... From my, from my young experience growing up in church, I've always taken it very seriously because it either is or it isn't real. If it's real, then I'm all in. If it's not real, then who cares? And, and you kind of have to decide. But if it's real, I want to be effective while I'm here. I want to go to an effective church where we're stirring one another on towards good deeds, like the Bible says too. In Hebrews, in 3.13 through 15, it says this, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And see, here's, here's the hard part about that. Encourage one another day after day. Well, we, we live in a culture that has such separation in our lives. We, did, we have no idea. Like you could have the hardest heart and be like knee deep in sin and I have no idea. 
You understand that because we're so privatized and we're not encouraging one another day after day. And I, I don't think it means like, oh, you know, buck up, you know, um, don't be sad, buck up. I think it's saying this, hey, the day of his return is coming. Let's make sure that we are pure and effective as his bride so that when he comes, we won't be embarrassed at his coming, as James says, right? For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. So we're supposed to hold fast. Do you see how he's, he's asking you to, in the first one, pay closer attention? And now he's saying, now hold fast. Does it matter how serious you take this thing? At the end of the day, when all this is wrapped up, and we're all standing before him, will it matter how serious you took the gospel? Or is it like Disney World, we're all just going to get the same kind of pass and walk into that place? I'm not comparing heaven to Disney World, I'm just saying. It matters. It really matters because his glory is on the line. And his glory is everything. And what I mean by that is you have the ability that he's given you to give him glory by the way that you live, the choices you make, how 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 you can stand firm or not, how you can live for him or not, right? How cool would this be if we started to ask each other, hey, instead of saying, how are you doing, which is self-focused, we ask, how have you been loving? How have you been loving today? Who cares about how you're doing? Probably not doing well unless you're doing his will. So let's just get on with asking the question. Have you done his will today? Have you seen anybody else today? Were you able, you were around people all day, but you can be around people and not actually see people. Is, has anybody ever done that? You went through your day, and, and at the end of the day, if I said, hey, did you love anybody today on purpose? You could say, I've done this. I've just been like, no, I've just been walking around all day thinking about all the stuff I have to do. It's so easy to do, right? But this other thing I'm saying to do is even easier to do. It just takes a little bit. And just the way he's saying, like, you know, pay attention to, hold fast to, there's something in what Hebrews is saying is that there's a place to be even more intentional about how you're living. And have you guys ever done this? Have you ever tried to be more intentional and you fell flat on your face and you failed? It only drives you into him more. You say, man, I'm really not doing as well as I thought I would do here. I really need your help. I really can't do this thing on my own. And you're absolutely right. You really do need him. But it's the mission that drives you deeper into him. In Hebrews 4.1, it says this, Therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so he's saying, let's be all the more diligent. Let's be all, all the more diligent about entering into, into his throne room, into prayer and sitting before him. And let's receive the mercy and grace that we need so that we don't go other places that we might tend to to get relief. If you're in need, go to him. Get the mercy and grace that you need for the day. And don't miss out on it. Be diligent about it. Somebody asked me this, uh, well, no. People don't ask me anything. I always just say that. I always just tell people things. Um, whether they want to or not. Here's, here's the difference. Here is the, the secret. The secret, I'm going to write a book called The Secret. The secret to doing well as a Christian. The person who's doing well and the person who's falling apart. There's only one thing they decided. When you decide that the power of prayer and a prayer life when you decide that you can't live without it, you will be powerful. When you're still like, ah, oh, we'll see if I get around to praying today, or, oh, I really need God today because my circumstances. Once you decide that he is your daily bread, you're going to be good to go. But if you're sort of like waning on that, and it depends on the season, you will wane on that, and, and you will be like a, a wave tossed to and fro. The person who decided to take their prayer life seriously is seriously doing well, is seriously thinking about other people more so than themselves. But until you do that, until you're convinced of the power of prayer, to be convinced of the power of prayer, you probably need to pray for like 21 days in a row and see the kind of person you are coming out on the other side. 
But Grace told me I'm not allowed to preach on praying anymore because I always do, so. Hebrews 10, 23 through 27. Let us hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. So again, do you see how he's not saying, hey, continue to think theologically around these issues and have opinions about them. He's saying, hold on to this hope. Be intentional about what it is you've heard. Be diligent, right? So there's an action on your part to literally hold on to this sort of expectation on your life to be the gospel to people, okay? Now listen. Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another towards love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. It's a habit not to go to church. It is a habit to miss church. Going to church is natural. Missing church is unnatural. And some people develop an unnatural habit of missing it, okay? but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near for if we go on sinning. Do you guys see how older I'm getting? Instead of getting glasses, I'm like... (laughs) Over the years, it used to be like this, then I was like this. Put my head on on the slide here. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. See, here's the thing. See, these, 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 these people in here understood that there was this judgment of whether your name was written in the Lamb book's, Book of Life, right? And then there was this other judgment in which the individual will stand before God. And they had it in mind. They had it in view. They all knew it. And they all thought about it. And they knew that one day they were going to stand before him and give an account for their life. Therefore, they lived in such a way. We don't do that today. We're not allowed to talk about such things. There's this Christian pressure that everything's fine and don't worry about it and don't hurt someone's feelings, my God, whatever you do. Because someone's feelings are more important than these realities. And so if you hurt someone's feelings, that's the most politically incorrect thing you could ever do, don't do it, right? And it's just baloney. Here's the thing. If I was to walk away from the Lord, I can guarantee you I'd have a terrible expectation of that. I just would. I'd be be terrified. If I was in this sin and consistently practicing a sin that I wasn't repentant of, I would be terrified because I know that I have to stand before him because it's real to me. That's why I love the fear of the Lord Jesus Christ rejoiced in the fear of the Lord. It's the reality of who he is and that one day I'm I'm going to live with him forever. I'd rather not anger my eternal roommate, you know, before I get there. So what, what happens in the vital church? See, and I'm just going back, let's just go back and review where we came from. And we were talking about this thing in the beginning. When you came into the church, you're introduced to prayer Maybe you prayed sometimes, like before meals. How many of you guys were introduced to that? Well, you pray before meals and you thank them for your food, right? Or you say your 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 nighttime routine where you you talk to them before you go to bed. But nobody pulled me aside and said, you will die. He is your life source. If you don't meet with him in the morning and give thanks and have communion and focus on his sacrifice and what he did, and how that's changed you and who you are now, you are not going to make it. Your heart will become hard. And it's like that, that reality of the daily bread. Nobody, nobody, somebody just should have, you know. And I, I think like we're either getting, we're either taking the gospel more seriously and maybe, maybe our kids um, maybe if we live sort of effectively, maybe they'll see something and maybe they'll put on something and, 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 and maybe they'll take it more seriously than we did. But we can't take it less seriously than what we were shown. We've got to start moving this direction. And if we're going to move this direction, the only way to move is in effectiveness. And effectiveness, effectiveness means that you're actually living the gospel, which only happens when we encourage one another daily, which only happens if we're having conversations and holding each other accountable for it. I love... Um, 
asking somebody, how, are the, how, are you, how have you lived for the gospel today right after I did something cool for the gospel? That's a safe place to ask, just in case they ask you the question back. Well, funny, you should ask. Let me share with you my testimony. Anyway, so <laughs> you were introduced to either you prayed sometimes or it was the source of life, and you most likely got that from when you were church. Participation. I love that, w- that we have children here that participate in serving and doing that. Like, man, if I have, when my kids are, are, can be trustworthy with something, you know, I want them to serve and I want them to understand that this is the key to the keys of the kingdom is humility, humility demonstrated through service. And you're going to serve. The moment Brecken can serve, he will serve. I don't want to teach my kids that. You're not here to have someone teach you a lesson and be a spectator. You're here to serve the body. Other people will come as spectators, but you're going to come and serve the body of Christ because I want you to be given a grace. I want you to change the world. I was just telling him the other day, you're going to do great things for God. He, he uh, as I said, showed some people the video. He, every night he reminds Willow, our two-year-old, that she does not have Jesus Christ in her heart. <laughs> because every night they pray. And, and Erica and, and the kids, and sometimes I, I'm up there, or, or she was just up there the other night, and they're like, you know, let's pray. And, and he's not afraid to say, Jesus lives in my heart. He lives in mommy's heart. He doesn't live in your heart. And it's a true statement, so we never correct him. We're like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and um, uh, last, last, last night, Erica sent me the video of, uh, she said, I want to have Jesus in my heart. This little full sentence, I want to have Jesus in my heart. And so they prayed over her and said, you know, and she said, Jesus, come live in my heart. You know? And it was, it, it's adorable. But see, here's, here's the thing, and I, I'm, not, um, I'm not afraid to tell my two-year-old, we will see if he actually did come and live in your heart. We will see if you believe it. You know what I mean? I'm serious. Because the last thing I would want to do is give her an expectation of eternal salvation when I don't know. Okay, so, you, so let's say, for example, how many of you have said a salvation prayer and you've you know, come to Jesus, right? Excellent. For the other half of you, I want to open up this baptism after service. <laughs> It's amazing that you're, that you're here. You guys are funny. On my wedding day, I said, I do. We will find out if I did. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So uh, we got married, and we, we made a covenant, but we will find out if I made the covenant in my heart based on what? If we're buried next to each other, Right? And so when will we find out if you're saved? Is there a place to have assurance of salvation? Absolutely. But we, your life will show us whether or not you said I did or I do, right? So I'm not going to tell my two-year-old, congratulations, you're saved. Your life will tell us if you're saved. And if you're not thinking that way, change your mind. All right, so some of us went to church and there was this fellowship and you either, some of us attended church, some of us had friends in church, some of us had a mentor in church, 20 of you did, that was awesome, and some of us become mentors in church. Every single one of your goals is, should be to become a mentor, all right? And I'm not saying like, you know, well, you gotta wait till you're perfect. What I'm saying is you need to know what you can mentor at or not. Don't mentor people in things that you're not good at. You know what I mean? But if there's something in your life, and I've said this before, we've got to recognize the fruit in one another's lives. Because what's in my life that's, that's a grace given by God can be in your life. And what's in your life that I see can be in my life. You know, and so to be able to recognize that and actually have a relationship with each other. And finally, Scripture, um, the idea of it when you were young, you had been taught the Bible, or maybe you read the Bible for yourself, and maybe you're living and teaching the Bible to others. You can't park somewhere and just stay there for the rest of your life. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to have some dude tell me what the Bible says. You've got to read it, and you've got to live it, and you've got to be intentional about moving forward in this thing because to stop only means that you're going to be casual and ineffective at it. The most loving thing I could do for these two guys this week is say, how did you love people this week? It's one of the most loving things I could have ever done, and for grace. Because if, if you don't 
do that. If you're not checking in, it's so easy to just have this cloud come over your eyes, make this life about you. No one in here is like, oh, I can't wait to make it about me this afternoon, right? But we will live like it is just based on autopilot. But I'm telling you, there's a place for a church to be very effective at loving people. And as we're effective in finding out how ineffective and effective we are, the motive begins to change. And God begins to make it a pure motive. But we've got to get started on it. How many of you guys in here would like to go to the most effective church in America? How many of you would like to make this the most effective church in America? Rusty, you want that? All right. I didn't, I didn't see a hand. From now on, if the hands don't go up, thank you, Frank. If the hands don't go up, you might get called out. All right? I'm just joking. Guys, there's so much room to become the most effective church in America. What would we have to be to the most effective church in America? It's real simple. Everybody would have to be intentional about loving somebody this week. Just one person? Yeah. That's how ineffective we are. Right? That if everybody in here could raise their hand and say, I did this this week for somebody else, and my motive was because I knew you were going to ask me, he can start there. God can start there. And he wants to teach you about what you can do in his name. And he wants you to be bold, and he wants you to be courageous. And it doesn't have to be um, throwing somebody out of their wheelchair at the mall, okay? You can walk beside somebody in a hard season. There can be random acts of kindness. There's giving. There's sharing your faith. There are so many ways of expanding the kingdom that... Once they're known and we walk them out, that's when things get fun. Because there's ways that you're walking out the kingdom that I was meant to, but I don't even know about it yet because I haven't figured that out. So here's what I want to do. Let me just ask you guys this. As, as a corporate body, how many of you guys could probably love somebody this week on purpose in a specific way? Go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah? Hold on. All right. Put them down. This is all I'm asking you to do. We're going to try it, okay? Next week, we haven't figured out how we're going to do it, but I'm simply going to ask at some point in the service, hey, guys, um, open up your phone, or here's a a note card. I want you in five words or less, tell me what you did, okay? Just tell me, just your your testimony in five to seven words. What happened? What'd you do? We're going to collect that information and actually present to you what we all did the following week. We're just going to keep doing that for a little bit. Is everybody okay with that? Only take two minutes. And if we continue to do that, what if 90% of us in here were actually loving people on purpose? Would we be the most effective church in America? I think we'd be up there. And how much of your time is that? Five minutes? Because here's, here's the trap. Let me just say what it is. We could, pick an, we could put an expectation on you to come to church and come to our programs. And our programs are meant to equip you to minister. Okay? But what if in church you knew you were going to be asked about whether or not you lived it? I've never been asked that question in church. I've been expected to listen. And here's the difference between Greek and Hebrew thinking, okay? Greek thinking says this, I know it when I can repeat it. Hebrew thinking is this, I know it when I can live it, okay? So I I know somebody who's who's a marriage counselor who has been married three times. The person in whom they're with now is younger than their own Uh, children, right? And this person is a marriage counselor, all right? And that's our society. Now, uh, I'm not, you know, tearing up that person. What I'm saying is this. Our society would rather have you have the degrees than the life lived. I don't want to talk to the person who's been divorced three times. I want to talk to the person who's almost dead with their spouse, right? (laughs) Who's still with their spouse, you know, because they're old. (laughs) That's that's funny. You guys are so demented. <laughs> we got a long ways to go. But we're going to get there. So I'd rather talk to the person who's been married for 70 years, right, and is with that person and still loves them and honors them and cherishes them, who's death do us part, who's almost to that stage, rather than the person who has the degrees and knows all the right answers of what to say, right? And wouldn't you rather be, would you rather be a Greek-thinking church or a Hebrew-thinking church? Would you rather be able to repeat what the sermon was about, or would you rather be able to walk it out? I think everybody would say walk it out. A little bit of intentionality can tip it, 
right? Because as we grow as a church, this is what I don't like. When, when we talk about church growth, I don't like that, that the intentionality in ministry begins to cool down as we begin to satiate everybody's needs. That make sense? I'll say it again. I don't want the intentionality to go down. I want it to go up. I don't want to be concerned about your needs. I want you to be concerned about their needs outside of here. And if we grow as a church in that way, then amen. If we grow as a church thinking more outside, as we grow as a church as more people are being effective at, at this thing called the gospel towards other people and God begins to work on the motive because we're meeting with him in prayer, amen. That's what I'd like to say. I'd like to be the most effective church in America. And so you guys ready to do that next week? All right. You guys, since you guys are so agreeable, we're going to end four minutes early. So go ahead, stand up. <laughs> so next week, we don't know how yet. Joe Diorsi is going to figure this out. Okay? <laughs> but we are going to collect the data from you, and the following week we'll put it up. And every week we're just going to ask you. It shouldn't take more than two to three minutes in the service. I've never had anybody ask me in the service, did you love anybody this week? I think that's cool. I hope that becomes cultural because I bet you all you need is some reminders. All you need is a little bit more intentionality. You know, if, if somebody were to come up to me at KFC, a true friend, and say, hey, let's look at these calories together before we go into this $5 Phillips, you know? Maybe then I wouldn't be eating $5 Phillips. I haven't had one in a while. They are good. Anyway, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. We honor you. Lord, nobody in here has this twisted heart that's trying to get the gospel wrong. People do love you and we want to serve you. And this world begins to try to blind us um, to what it is that it, that's important. And we need reminders about what's important. We need each other to remind one another about what's important. We are not here to live for ourselves. We are here to live for you. And you told us to go love other people. We want to be that church. God, will you help us? Holy Spirit, will you help us become the most effective church in America? That we become a light that reflects you properly. We all pray this right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, will you remind us? We give you permission to point out people who are in need. We give you permission to talk to us about our shortcomings and things that we need to adjust in our own lives. And Lord, will you put out just a fire for prayer in our own lives again? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Have a great uh, Sunday.